Welcome to the Unitarian Christian Alliance podcast, episode 8. What if it's me, not Yahweh? John 8, 58. I'm your host, Mark Kane. This podcast is part of the UCA's effort to connect and serve Unitarian Christians around the world. Unitarian Christians are Christians who believe that God is one person, the Father. His human Son is the anointed Messiah, exalted and given authority over creation. To Him, indeed, every knee will bow. And as our King, we bow too. Clearly, we don't subscribe to the idea that kneeling to our human King is out of place or blasphemous. It's how we ascribe worth to the One who redeemed us, and who now reigns at God's right hand as our Lord the King sort of like they did in Revelation 5.9. See the UCA podcast episode number five, uh, Did God Put Coal in My Stocking?, where I elaborate on bowing before our king during my opening remarks. Today will be a bit different. I was asked a question using the record button I talk about every episode. You can find it at the end of the show notes. Hi, Mark. This is Tina from Ohio. I just had a quick question about John 8.58, where uh, Jesus says before Abraham was, I am. I know some people use that to cross-reference to Exodus 3, 13 through 16. And I was wondering if you could give your explanation to how you would explain that to somebody so that it would help them to understand that Jesus is not calling himself God. Thanks, Tina. John 8, 58 is one of those verses which, let's be honest, fits with a Trinitarian view. If it didn't, it wouldn't be tossed our way all the time. Oh, Tina, when I say you from this point forward, I'm not specifically talking to you. This is for anyone listening. Some may be Trinitarian or Unitarian. You means the you who is listening right now. You. Let me first qualify what I'm going to say today. I do not have a doctorate in anything. I'm not a published author. I've got no articles in journals And I'm not a Trinitarian. I mean, how much more uncredentialed and clearly untrustworthy could I be? If anything I say today is reasonable, you may as well assume I got lucky. For sure, however, you know better than to believe it just because I said it. I better pause there, too. If you think like that, if you have a tendency to take other people's word on topics, stop. If something is true, it's because it's true because you know and can confirm it's true. Not because I said it, or anyone else. Do not accept my words without question. That's what folks do when they want others to do their thinking for them. You're better than that. If you're Trinitarian and you're using John 8.58 as your draw four card, (laughs) it's because you know it's exactly what you know it means. It's like a slam dunk. I mean, I get it. You would have used the verse about the three persons sharing the same divine essence. But that verse hasn't turned up yet. Since there actually are no explicit Trinitarian verses, you have to use those that really look like it when you look at it the way you look at it. To be fair, you're not the only ones who use this technique. We all do this. We have an idea that we really, really believe is true. And anything that supports or sounds like who at least fits with that idea, we grab a hold of and hold aloft as a shining example of our brilliance and correctness. And anything that does not support that idea, we just dismiss, ignore, or reach into our bag of theories to explain why contradictions aren't contradictions. That's a lovely bag. Don't go anywhere without that bag. We do whatever it takes. Our ego really likes to feel right. I mean, really likes it. Being wrong threatens to humble us, and who's got time for that? So, John 8, 58. The Jewish opponents here react quite violently to Jesus' statement, before Abraham was, I am. Aha! Those wise and brilliant Jews. They obviously realized that Jesus clearly just evoked the name of God from the Old Testament, Exodus 3, 14, I am who I am. Note, it doesn't say that's what they were thinking. John doesn't do that thing where he fills in extra details to help the reader. But see, if you're Trinitarian, it doesn't have to say it. Again, because reading it this way supports a Trinitarian view. 
And because a Trinitarian view is the only right view, that's the right way to read it. Obviously. This tendency is so well understood, there's a name for it. Confirmation bias. Let me pause once more. I'm not actually going to fully lay out an explanation of this passage here in this episode. I'm not a Bible answer man, and I can be wrong. What I am going to do is lay out a way of thinking of this passage, which, as I see it, works or fits with a non-Trinitarian view. Then I'm going to suggest some great resources, because it's the UCA, and that's what we're about. Note, I said I will describe it in a way that fits with a Unitarian understanding. That means I'm not claiming that my explanation is proof of a particular view. It's simply a way to interpret it that at least has merit and justification. This passage can and does fit a Unitarian view. This may be surprising. If you're a Trinitarian and you've only been told about the proper Trinitarian view of this verse, it may never have entered your mind that there's an alternate way to read this. Well, there is. You just weren't told about it. Because, well, honestly, I think it's because there aren't that many verses like this, verses that fit well enough with a Trinitarian view to be used as proof. This is one of the golden ones. What would be the point of telling you other perspectives on this when you know the other perspectives are wrong? The logic is flawless. So, no, my explanation is not going to be proof of a Unitarian view of God. It's simply going to present this verse in a way that is compatible with the belief that Jesus is a man who told us what he heard from God, John 8, 40, the God who is his Father and our Father, John 20, 17. I really don't think the Trinitarian's explanation of 858 qualifies as proof either. It's delivered like it's proof, sure, but it's not. It's an interpretation which sounds like a Trinitarian proof because one is thinking in a particular way, like thinking that, one, the Jewish opponents actually understood Jesus clearly, those wise and thoughtful students, and like thinking that, two, I am simply couldn't mean anything else. If you're a Trinitarian and you think like that, then, yeah, run with it. It's a Trinitarian proof text pronouncing that Jesus is the great I am from the Old Testament. But if you're willing to consider other possibilities, then the passage gets repositioned to simply one that can be easily read Trinitarianish, but that doesn't have to be. Maybe this next admission will help. The way I understand this passage doesn't have to rule out Trinitarian ideas. How about that? The Trinity could be entirely true, and this verse could still mean what I'm going to suggest it means. If you continue to believe in the Trinity after I get through this, you may just decide this particular verse isn't exactly the obvious slam dunk you thought it was. Cool, you've learned a few things, and maybe now you'll favor John 1-1 more heavily. That's up to you. So here's what your Sunday school teacher may not have told you. First, the Jewish opponents were not hitting all the balls Jesus pitched. Not at all. They actually misunderstood Jesus. A lot. To think, look, they understood him clearly, is really a bad move. Maybe they did. But dude, do not side with the blind and deaf unless you have a really good reason to do so. And siding with them because then this verse agrees with you is not a really good reason. John goes out of his way in his gospel to show that Jesus' opponents misunderstood him often. I won't list them all, because I trust you can figure that out by just reading his book. It's a great read. Plus, if you spend some time with the resources I'll mention later, you'll get all of these particulars. Second, your Sunday school teacher may also not have told you that the I am, Jesus said, was actually a common phrase that had an already common meaning. It's a phrase that John used frequently in his book. But here, in this verse, are we confident that it's clearly the name of God? See, that's curious. That should be talked about way more often. The phrase in Greek is ego imi. 
and it usually means, I am the one, or I am he. And that's how the translators treat it when putting it into English. Except here. Ooh, that is curious. It's like you're in a crime drama, and you just found out the wife had increased the life insurance policy on her recently deceased husband. Ooh, that's an interesting fact. But nah, the husband surely died of a naturally occurring case of pillow over the face. But it is fascinating, isn't it? Here, one place where we clearly get a Trinitarian proof text is also one place where we switch the typical use of ego in me. Hmm. You don't need to see this information. We don't need to see this information. These aren't the facts you're looking for. These aren't the facts we're looking for. Uh, are you still listening? Oh, good. You have resistance to Jedi mind tricks. Let me put it into some common modern vernacular. Think, it's me. Ego in me is used like you and I use it's me. To understand what it might mean if you use ego in me by itself, just imagine happening upon a stranger who calls out on the street corner, It's me! You'd be curious, a bit puzzled. You'd be trying to figure out, what was just going on? What am I missing? What is the context? Because it's me, by itself, doesn't work until you know what identity is in question. Give me the context, you say. Of course. Maybe you look around the street and notice a man approaching person after person on the street asking, Did you lose your cell phone? Did you lose your cell phone? Ah, he's looking for this guy on the corner. It's me means I'm the one. This guy lost his cell phone. See, it's not too hard. Say you are writing a short story and you plan at the end, the climax, for the main character to call out, It's me! What do you do? Well, you build up the context. You set the scene. You generate an uncertainty. Is it him? Is it not? Could it be? Could it not? Now you're set for the big finale in your story. John does a perfect job of this in chapter 9 during the discovery phase of the blind man that Jesus had healed. Jesus made mud, put it on his eyes, and sent him to a pool to wash. He did this on the Sabbath stepping outside the proper boundaries established by the religious authorities. Ooh, yes, the plot thickens. The people start talking. The streets are abuzz. The neighbors and folks who had known him before are chattering, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Then someone said, It is him. And others said, No, he just looks like him. Out of this chatter and uncertainty, one man appears and repeats this curious phrase over and over. It's me. It's me. It's me. That's how you do it. That's how John did it. You set the stage, you build the context, you show an uncertain or undecided identity. Then, one steps forward and claims that identity. Ego a me. I am he. It's me. This short story where the blind man clearly declares himself to be Yahweh... <laughs> is the very next event after Jesus has had his ego in me moment with the Jews. The before Abraham was, I am seen in John 8, 58. If John expected you to read one ego in me as, I am that I am, Yahweh, and then 10 verses later read it as simply, Hey, it's me, then it seems John's being clever. Um obtuse? I mean, he wrote this book for folks in his day and the future to read people who talked like this. It's not an outlier that the blind man would call out, it's me, to clear up the confusion. This is how they talked. So John uses the same commonly understood language back to back and means entirely different things? Mm, sure, he could have. But he also could have meant the same thing both times, and it wouldn't be strange at all. What's more, suppose John the Gospel writer not only used the same phrase twice, 
What if he used the same narrative structure both times? What if in both cases, Jesus and the blind man, John set the stage, built the context, and demonstrated an uncertain or undecided identity? Wow, if John writes the same words using a similar narrative structure back to back, you'd have to admit that reading it the same way is not that crazy. Not crazy at all. It's not some desperate Unitarian attempt to wave our hands and dismiss an otherwise obvious passage that doesn't agree with us. We're not pulling out some novel and clever methods to make it say something else, right? Aren't we saying, read it here, like it would have been read in the next chapter, too? So, the resources I'll mention shortly will let you dive into this more deeply. They'll talk more about the Greek words John used. They'll discuss some other problems with what I would call a sloppy interpretation of this verse. It isn't a cut-and-dry, home-run Trinity proof text. But first, a dramatic retelling of the story beginning back in John 7, highlighting the relevant points to our topic today, and skipping past others for the sake of brevity. Join me now on a short trip through a tense and fascinating showdown between Jesus and his Jewish opponents. It was the Feast of Booths, and Jesus' brothers were pushing him to go to Judea. It was a rather dangerous idea, as the Jewish leaders there were already intent on killing him. Let everyone see your great works, they said. Show yourself to the world. Make your identity known. Jesus did go to Judea, but quietly, keeping a low profile. The Jewish opposition was already looking for him, roaming about, asking people, Where is he? Not surprisingly, that stirred a lot of interest. And the people were talking. A lot. Muttering, actually. They didn't want to attract the attention of the violently angry leaders, intent on spilling blood. He's a good man, some said. No, he's leading people astray, said others. Jesus had captured the attention of the peoples of Judea. Then, in the middle of the feast, Jesus shows up in the temple and starts teaching with powerful and engaging words. How is it that this man has such learning? The people wondered. He's never studied, the people marveled. Jesus explains that his authority is not his own. His teaching is not his own. And then he jabs the leaders who speak on their own authority. He accuses them of not keeping the law of Moses. Why do you seek to kill me? He asks. Is this guy someone who's demon-possessed? Some people think. They are really struggling with this curious, extraordinary man. Then they start to figure it out. Isn't this the one the leaders want to kill? And here he is speaking openly. And why are they staying silent? Could it... Could it be that they know he actually is the Messiah? The opposition's silence was short-lived, but the people, their curiosity was entirely fueled. They started having debates about where the Messiah was supposed to come from. Meanwhile, Jesus continued to teach about the one who sent him, the one who is true, and many people began to believe in him. When the Messiah appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? they asked themselves. And then the Pharisees got wind of what the crowds were talking about, and they couldn't stand it any longer. They sent out officials to arrest him. Meanwhile, Jesus continued to teach, I am going to the one who sent me. Where does this man intend to go? They wonder, hanging on and enthralled by his every word. On the last day of the feast, Jesus stands up and cries out, Whoever thirsts, let him come to me. Whoever believes in me, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. The debates on his identity roared to new levels. This really is the prophet, some said. This is the Messiah, said others. Wait, he came from Galilee, didn't he? Isn't the Messiah supposed to be a descendant of David and come from David's village, Bethlehem? Uncertainty divided the people as they debated this man's identity, vigorously. The officers sent to arrest him returned to the leaders. Uh, we don't have him. 
And, uh, no one has ever spoken like this man. Have you also been deceived? Nicodemus, one of the leaders sympathetic to Jesus, noted, Does our law judge a man without giving him a hearing? Scoffing, the leaders respond and impugn Jesus' legitimacy. No prophet comes from Galilee. Nicodemus' suggestion was not taken. Finally, Jesus and the Pharisees meet, and the sparks start flying. I am the light of the world, Jesus proclaimed. Bah, said the Pharisees. You are bearing false witness about yourself. Your testimony isn't true. Jesus then delivered his first verbal punch. You do not know where I come from, and you judge according to the flesh. My judgment is true because I am not alone. Your own law states that the testimony of two is true. Please count along with me. I bear witness about myself, and then my Father who sent me bears witness about me. That's two. Where is your Father? They responded. If you knew me, you'd know my Father also, Jesus continued, unabated in his steady but sharp verbal assault. You will die in your sin. Where I'm going, you cannot come. You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. Unless you believe that it's me, you will die in your sins. Finally, Jesus brought up the topic of his identity right in their faces. Using ego in me here, saying, it's me, they seem to have recognized it as a claim to an identity. Naturally, they want to know what identity he was referring to. What's an it's me without a context, right? So who are you? They ask. Just what I have been telling you from the beginning, Jesus answered. They had not been listening, it seems. This identity that Ego and me referred to is the one that Jesus had been repeatedly working to establish. While many in the crowds were getting it, the Pharisees had dismissed that he was a prophet or Messiah. They were blind to his identity. Jesus gets very explicit next, telling them his identity outright, plainly. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that it's me. Yeah, ego and me pointing to an actual identity, the identity of the Son of Man from the prophecies of Daniel 7, the Son of Man who is given all authority by the Ancient of Days. And then next, perhaps to validate what was written in Daniel 7, he confirmed that his authority was indeed just as Daniel described, derived, given, not intrinsically his. I do nothing on my own authority, but I speak just as the Father taught me. He has not left me alone, for I always do what pleases Him. Now many were believing. What originally was uncertainty as to His identity, that of the promised prophet and Messiah, they'd now heard it right from His mouth. He was the Son of Man, destined to reign over the kingdom with no end, the Messiah for sure. It's Him! Then in the next verbal battle, he delivered an even harsher blow to his enemies. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you've heard from your father. Abraham is our father, they raged. But Jesus accuses them of not following Abraham. If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. Unsurprisingly, Jesus continued to press the topic of his identity. You seek to kill me, a man who has told you what I heard from God. This identification positioned himself as a messenger, agent, or prophet from God. They weren't impressed. Jesus continued, You are doing the works of your father. We aren't born of sexual immorality, they fume. We have one father, God. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. Clearly enraged, they offered a counterproposal to his identity. 
aren't we right in saying actually you are a Samaritan and have a demon? I do not have a demon, but I honor my father. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it, and he is the judge. If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets. Are you greater than our father Abraham? Who do you think you are? The Pharisees just had to do it. Directly compared Jesus with Abraham. Abraham was their guy after all. Jesus, however, was about to take the opportunity to place Abraham in a more proper light. Not as one greater than the Messiah, but as one who understood that the Messiah would come. Abraham knew God would bless the nations through his offspring because Abraham believed what God had promised him. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. Their rage and anger probably made it even harder than normal for them to understand what he was saying. They bellow, You are not yet fifty years old, and you've seen Abraham? (laughs) Yeah, uh, no, (laughs) that's not what he had said. But Jesus wasn't done. He had just corrected them by explaining that his identity was established and understood at the time of Abraham. Their own father, Abraham, got it. But next, Jesus drives his point even further back in time. It predates Abraham, their father. It was established from the start. Truly, I tell you, even before Abraham was, it's me. At this, they picked up stones to throw at him. But he walked away. This entire story that moved through the days of the feast began with and repeatedly emphasized his identity. It was the talk of the town. Is this man the promised one, the Messiah, or not? Into this context, Jesus answers repeatedly, It's me. It's me now because God is bearing witness. It's me from way back when Abraham received the promise. He knew it. It's me since even before Abraham. It was always destined to be me. Jesus said ego a me three times in this prolonged argument. Let's just be charitable to John and assume he delivered his message consistently and purposefully. Clarifying the identity of Jesus was, after all, the reason he wrote his whole book. It was so we would know Jesus was the Messiah, the Son of God. Look at what Jesus is explicitly called, not inferred, but explicit. The Pharisees call him a man. The people call him a man. He calls himself a man, a man who told us what he heard from his father. Over and over again, He points to his father as the one he gets his teaching from, the source of his authority, the one who gives him words. Everything leading up to John 8.58 would have Jesus as a man following and doing what God had commanded him. You know, a prophet, an anointed one of God. Are we really confident that John expected the reader to see the same phrase used repeatedly to establish Jesus' identity to see it here in 858 as something quite remarkably different than everything that led up to it? John, really? If that's what you meant, why didn't you do us a favor and throw in one of those parenthetical comments like you sometimes do when you worry the reader might get confused? So the Jewish opponents picked up stones. How is that proof that Jesus was claiming to be Yahweh? They had planned to kill him before he even got to Judea. Then Jesus pounds them with verbal lashings that they were not of God, murderers, living shamefully opposite of how their beloved Abraham lived, and that they were sons of the devil. Finally, at the end of all that, we're supposed to believe it went down like, oh, hold on now, Jesus just committed blasphemy, that's too much, we're going to have to stone him. Right. They probably brought their stones in with them, you know, the ones about the size of a baseball so that you can get a good grip, yet still throw it hard enough to really crush some skull. Honestly, I'm impressed they held off that long. 
I'll be the first to admit that this is not a very practical explanation of this verse. I mean, it's mostly a telling of a story. It's not in-depth and thorough, and I'm admitting that, but I felt it was worth it. I believe a certain amount of immersion into the scene, the culture, and the mindset of the day makes the process of study more engaging. So the resources I'll mention here are by no means all that are available. They're just a subset, a small subset, of the sources that are Unitarian in perspective. I know what you might be thinking. Ah, he only wants them to read Unitarian materials, not those that are Trinitarian. I see right through this scheme. Well, I'm glad you might have had that thought. Actually, I want you to read whatever God puts in your path. Please, read more Trinitarians on this. See if the authors say anything about what I suggested here. Or, if they don't, ask yourself, why not? By all means, read and consider as much Trinitarian teachings as you can find. Here, I'm just filling in the Unitarian gaps. For each of the following, the links are in the show notes. The Whirlwind Tour begins now. OneGodWorship.com See the UCA podcast episodes 2, 3, and 4 to appreciate the backstory of Hildy Chandler. This is a resource of well-written articles with a search option. There's a link to the John 858 article in the show notes. Dustin Smith hosts the Biblical Unitarian podcast, and he covers this in episode 68, What Does Son of God Mean in John's Gospel, part 5. I love audio resources. I'm biased, I guess. Stay tuned to meet Dustin in person on this podcast. GraceMinistryInternational.org This is a church in the Chicago area with an online ministry. I hope even more groups can do this kind of thing in the future. What is helpful here is that they have both audio and text on their teaching section. They also post YouTube videos of the teachings as well. I know that takes time to do. Thanks to Chuck LaMatina for his work here. Here's something unique. There's a translation being produced by Spirit and Truth Fellowship International. This translation is online, and it's unique because as they update and improve it, the updates go live. Read more about it at their site, revisedenglishversion.com. The link in the show notes takes you to John 8.58, and there's a commentary included, as well as a YouTube video at the end. Sean Finnegan's podcast, Restitutio, had an episode number 351, Did Jesus Claim to Be the I Am? Translating John 8.58. The link in the show notes has the podcast audio and a video version, too, with slides. Some websites were designed so that you could search for materials by scripture reference. ChristianMonotheism.com has a resource page with a Choose a Scripture option. It lists many verses and then provides resources of various types for each verse. BiblicalUnitarian.com is another one like that, with a whole section based on verses. John 8.58 is featured in both of these sites. And let's not forget actual books. Many groups have produced books through the years. They have sites to browse and purchase them. As an example, the Christadelphians, a biblical Unitarian group with a history dating back over 150 years. They've produced many books, and several websites sell them. Since we're talking John here, I'll reference just one book as an example, The Gospel of John by John Carter on Christadelphianbooks.com. The Christadelphians are also digitizing many of the older books and making them freely available. Not just them, though. Other groups have been doing this as well. I include a link to some digitized books on Christadelphia.org as an example. Thanks to UCA member Andrew White for helping me with the above Christadelphian links. There you have it, barely scratching the surface of what's out there. It's astounding what can be found today. This is probably how they felt when they started producing Bibles from a printing press. If I didn't mention your resource, I'm sorry. I wanted a few types to help demonstrate the breadth of possibilities. Though I'm sure after hearing my in-depth exposition of John 8.58, you can go about your business. You can go about your business. Thanks to all of you who put the effort into making your websites, videos, podcasts, articles, and books available for the world. God bless you. Uh, This is Kent Wheeler from Oklahoma. I've enjoyed what Sister Chandler had to say. We're from the same background. I'm still attending here locally 
and looking for people that are like-minded. Uh, if you're out there, why, give me a call. Thanks for leaving the message, Kent. You're expressing what many Unitarian Christians think and feel. They want a community, fellowship, a place they can sit together, laugh, cry, pray, study, play bagpipes. You're not alone, Kent. You may feel isolated right now in Oklahoma, and when I checked at the start of 2021, there aren't any other members in the UCA nearby. But rest assured, you do have a community. We're just spread out around the globe. We are seekers, just like you. We love truth, just like you. And we enjoy a good laugh together. And I know you do, too. I called you the other day. It was great to meet you. Maybe this side of the kingdom, you only meet a few of us. But when that day comes, if you like, you can come sit with me at the banquet. At the lunch banquet. Not the dinner banquet. I plan to be sitting with my parents at dinner. You understand. Thank you, Kent. I know there are others out there, and some probably aren't that far from you. We're kind of everywhere. Just many of us haven't realized what we can do about it yet. Well, the UCA is trying to fill that gap. We'll see how it turns out. In the meantime, the UCA directory has helped people meet others who would have never met otherwise. There are people who felt alone who now know for certain they aren't. If that's something you want to be a part of, man, I'd appreciate it. Kent appreciates it. As of January 2021, the UCA has members in 35 countries around the world. I tell you, we're everywhere. Wherever there's a Bible to read, there's someone reading Jesus' prayer in John 17, 3 and taking it to heart. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus the Messiah whom you have sent. Thank you for being a part of this. And thanks for telling your friends about this slightly peculiar podcast. I know you are. There's a steadily increasing number of downloads. I'm humbled. And I'm excited for what the coming years will bring. May God bless you in your truth pursuits. I hope this podcast serves you well. Move along. Move along. Move along.